Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk ETC. Um, Carlo can't make it. He's on travel. And so I will be doing the show today. We have a great show. We've got two guests. We have Charles Hoskinson and Roman Alinkoff. Did I pronounce that correctly, Roman? Uh, yes, Roman Olinikov. Yes. Okay. And we're going to be discussing the Treasury proposal and uh, related topics. So let's uh, get started. Um, why don't you, uh, Charles, I know a lot of people know of you, but you want to say something as an introduction just in case somebody doesn't, hasn't heard of you? Um, I think at this point, if people haven't heard of me, then they, do, they don't want to hear of me. Um, very briefly, <laughs> I'm the uh, CEO of IOHK. Uh, we work on cryptocurrencies and do a lot of uh, first principles research. We're, uh, we're also leading the Growth of Deek team, uh, which has been on previously, and uh, the team is responsible for uh, building a full Scala client for uh, Ethereum Classic. Um, IOHK also does a lot of uh, basic research into the design of cryptocurrencies, everything from blockchain architecture to incentives. And we work on things, for example, like the treasury we're going to discuss today. Okay. And uh, Roman, um, why don't you say a little bit about yourself, how you got into uh, cryptocurrencies, Ethereum Classic, things like that. I joined this topic one year ago. Uh, before it, uh, I did uh, uh, very deep research uh, in uh, <coughs> cryptography, uh, in symmetric cryptography, in network security, in software uh, security uh, in Ukraine. And uh, uh, one year ago, I got a chance uh, to, jo uh, to join IOHK and I got here uh, uh, excellent uh, chances, uh, very interesting chances uh, to research uh, uh, blockchain technologies, and uh, I'm lucky with it. So uh, my current project is uh, Ethereum Classic and uh, Ethereum Classic Treasury, and it's uh, really interesting and exciting. Okay, and so you have a, a cryptography background, strong math background, and so that helps you uh, security background to understand the the ins and outs of these proposals. Is that correct? Uh, yes, you're quite right. Uh, I, uh, I have a uh, deep ma ma mass background uh, in, cri uh, in crypto uh, in, uh, and also in mass. Uh, I did my PhD uh, thesis, my habilitation dissertation uh, in symmetric crypto, and it greatly helps uh, to deeply understand the architecture, the properties, uh, to uh, give some proofs uh, of uh, the system and so on. Yes, it deeply helps in cryptocurrencies. Okay, so um, welcome both of you. And so we're, the topic is, is the treasury proposal. So the cryptocurrency space has evolved since Satoshi first presented to the world uh, Bitcoin. And we're now, people are now talking about adding privacy, which is really cool, um, Dash and, and Zcash. And now we're discussing governance models. And so things have really, advanced since a couple, from a couple years ago. So, um, but you guys are the experts. So why don't I let you guys now introduce the treasury proposal better than I can. Um, so All right, well, I can, I, can, I, I can start with the principles and then I guess Roman can get into the design. Um, so uh, when I first started working in uh, Ethereum Classic, one of my goals was to try to create a project that was as balanced as possible. So, you know, you know, whenever you have a power vacuum or there's a lot of fragmentation, everybody wants to form a camp and announce that there's a, a leader. And what I've noticed uh, with a lot of these projects, they tend to follow Moses-driven development. Uh, you know, like Moses, the guy who leads you to the promised land, comes down with the tablets and tells you the Ten Commandments and says, I'll, I'll take you there, um, which can be quite good if you have a Steve Jobs. But um, if you have a Jim Jones, then, you know, you <laughs> probably probably you're not going to have a good day, right? So uh, we, uh, we said, well, you know, if we're going to get involved in this project, what we ought to say as a differentiator for ETC versus Ethereum or, frankly, other projects like Bitcoin, which follow a different development pro uh, standard called, I like to call titanic driven development, um, is that, uh, is that we, we need to figure out a way of balancing power. And so it was so super, super important to me that we saw competing development teams like we see ETC dev and they're right now carrying the ecosystem on their back and they're, they're responsible for the dev work that's uh, done the last two hard forks and uh, what allows ETC to survive. But then they're counterbalanced by the existence of the growth and deep team, which will become increasingly more relevant over time. But then that extends in, 
just beyond development. You have to talk about community management. You have to talk about uh, the flow of information. There needs to be some diversity there. There needs to be people in kind of a, an explainer in chief role. Um, there needs to be a, a lot of um, checks and balances. So one of the things that's uh, coming up over and over again is, well, where's funding going to come from uh, for the, the project long term? Now, uh, we could examine a bunch of different models. Like one model is to say, uh, well, you can do crowd sale as an example. And that's a good model. It actually, it's, it's proven to be very effective with Ethereum. Uh, but the challenge with that model is that a single group of actors controls the money. And so then the whole project centralizes around them. And if you, if you like them, you're back into Moses-driven development. If you don't like them, well, you're still stuck in that paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, another way is the donation model where you say, okay, well, whoever is doing work, you know, they'll put out my can, shake it, and hopefully somebody will give me some money. And unfortunately, that model has variable returns. Um, first, there tends to be a lot of favoritism in, you know, that the people who are the most vocal or best branded tend to get the money, not necessarily the people who are doing the best work. Second, um, the funding model tends to be very inconsistent in general, that maybe some months you have a lot of money coming in and other months you're pretty tight. And if you think about when you would need money the most, it tends to be the time when the currency is going through the hardest times. If there's a sudden price collapse and a lot of hacks occur and people are leaving the ecosystem, you probably have to double down and invest and get more developers and get more marketing and more things done to get excitement back up. But that's exactly the time of when your donations are going to be the, the smallest because people are losing confidence in the project. So donation-driven development to me has always seemed to be a really curious way of running an ecosystem that we anticipate uh, people putting money into. And then the other option is to do kind of like a patronage style development where you have uh, basically well-capitalized actors, like for example, IOHK come in and say, we're going to fund a development team. But then that kind of suffers from the same flaw as the ICO model, where uh, that entity now has a lot of influence and control over the roadmap and the ecosystem and where to take it. And that entity could uh, at least be perceived to move the ecosystem in a way that the stakeholders don't want to for their own personal benefit. So we asked very early on, uh, is there a way that we can kind of divorce ourselves as a community from this style of governance and embrace something new? Uh, so I had Roman's team uh, begin a pretty hardcore analysis of the Dash treasury model, because to me the Dash model was one of the few things out there where it seemed at least uh, you know, on the surface, you would be able to uh, to decentralize the pool of capital and the access to that pool of capital a, a little bit. Uh, so they started a, a pretty aggressive uh, a project, and um, I guess Roman can kind of tell you some of the things he discovered and some of the things they learned from uh, from studying Dash. Okay, uh, Roman, you want to take it away? Uh, yes, uh, thanks. So to continuation of what uh, Charles uh, already say, uh, said, so uh, when we are using cryptocurrency, we believe, uh, and it is a necessary condition, that there are honest ma uh, majority of participants who run full nodes uh, or master nodes in uh, Dash. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, But besides uh, it, uh, there are uh, another conditions. Uh, for example, besides honest majority of uh, participants, uh, we need to have strong consensus protocol, we need to have uh, a strong crypto uh, behind uh, this consensus protocol and we need uh, to have a secure implementation secure implementation of this protocol uh, and uh, all of these conditions are necessary uh, if we fail in uh, one of them um, we may, may fail uh, in the whole crypto cryptocurrency security uh, so uh, uh, here we need uh, to uh, uh, <coughs> besides uh, uh, so uh, besides on, uh, honest majority of participants, we need uh, to have a secure uh, and uh, trusted uh, implementation. And uh, having it decentralized, uh, having it decentralized gives us uh, much more chances uh, to get necessary solution comparing uh, uh, with centralized uh, development, uh, uh, which may, may happen when one company or a couple of companies uh, will give uh, funds uh, for uh, cryptocurrency development. So we looked at Dash experience and uh, we liked it very much uh, because it's a really working model. Uh, they did it uh, from the very beginning. They provided uh, a really good working uh, model. It uh, provides good funding for 
uh, dash development we looked uh, for this model we did deep analysis of, of it uh, and uh, we looked uh, uh, to the ways how can we improve it we uh, why don't you for everybody's benefit take us through kind of how a, a dash uh, proposal is made so let's say alice wants to get to uh, submit a proposal how, how would she do that in dash uh, so uh, they uh, just uh, uh, create such proposal, uh, they burn uh, some small amount of money, and after that it goes into the system uh, uh, of master nodes, uh, into the network of master nodes, it added uh, to the database of uh, master nodes uh, of uh, Dash, and after that owners of master nodes uh, can see this proposal and can, uh, and can vote uh, for, uh, for it. After that, uh, the most uh, popular proposals are uh, selected. Uh, they filtered uh, to have at least 10% uh, uh, of uh, support uh, <coughs> uh, 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 of support of this uh, project. And after that, the most popular proposals are uh, funded. Uh, the, fu uh, f uh, the funding is made uh, through uh, so-called uh, super blocks, and these super blocks are uh, issued uh, monthly. So essentially, it's uh, the simplified explanation would be it's so so it's just voting. You you submit your proposal. They have their their system to to store it, and then people place their vote. And uh, so, what could go wrong? How would you answer that question? Um, well, there there's lots of voting mechanisms. We there was the carbon vote before or regarding the Dow fork. So there's um, what would you say are the issues with that? um that you found the biggest ones uh so, uh, so uh, uh in dash it is implemented a good voting mechanism where uh, each master node can uh, vote for each proposal uh, but uh, when we do a theoretical analysis of this mo uh, model uh, we found out that there are no uh, theoretical model uh, for uh, for it at all so this system practically wor works but uh, in uh, theory uh, it is used a quite uh, a little bit different model uh, okay. it is a very important condition for existing theoretical models that uh, voting must be uh, secret until uh, it ends so okay. uh, when uh, when somebody votes, uh, he uh, he or she uh, doesn't know uh, the results of uh, voting for uh, other uh, participants until uh, the last one uh, has finished his voting. Only okay. after that, votes are opened. Okay. Uh, in Dash, uh, uh, it is presented everything uh, in open. Uh, 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 from 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 the very beginning, and uh, from theoretical point of view, it can be improved. Okay, so all right, so the they it's open voting, and because it's not private, that leads to some concerns and issues that need to be resolved. All right, that yeah. that makes sense. Yes, uh, yeah, you're quite right. Uh, for example, from uh, theoretical, uh, uh, it's only theoretical uh, point of view. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, rather unlikely to happen in practice. But when votes are divided 50-50 uh, and uh, the last voter uh, gets uh, his chance to vote, he, uh, he can select uh, his vote uh, will uh, select the final decision. Okay. So, uh, uh, in, in such a model, uh, the last voter, in very unlikely cases, but it's possible uh, in very unlikely cases, uh, uh, the last voter uh, can have um, uh, more power comparing uh, uh, to voters who vote earlier. Uh, it m might create incentive to uh, vote later, for example. Yeah. But it's uh, uh, some theoretical view. Uh, to uh, create a system uh, uh, where there are no such uh, open questions, so we proposed uh, uh, to keep uh, all ballots closed until everyone has uh, finished his voting. Okay, all right. Um, so if, if I could just interject, this is uh, maybe semi-tangential, but what is going on with the Dash guys? They are just so impressive. They they were doing anonymous currency, you know, I, I guess before anybody else. And then, right. and then now they have the this tr basically voting mechanism, and so they. I mean, too bad we can't uh, get some of those guys to uh, join. Right. MTC. Well, I, I mean, you know, I think what ends up happening in our space is that uh, people tend to to, to focus on one thing, and then say, "Oh, if that one thing is not right, everything else is wrong." And so, if you if you decompose a cryptocurrency as an ecosystem into components, you have things like your blockchain and your scripting language and your consensus algorithm and your network stack. And then you have this notion of marketing and governance. How do you accrue a community and how do you reach decisions in a community and how do you get the community engaged and evolved? 
if you look at Dash as a technology stack, um, their core innovation has been the, the treasury model. And we've certainly found some issues with it. And they've corrected some of them with 12.1. It's, it's an ongoing debate about what makes a good treasury model. But what they've done exceptionally well, above and beyond uh, that, that innovation and maybe some privacy innovations, is that they have managed to construct a very evangelistic and vocal community. And you know, if any cryptocurrency wants to grow and survive, they always have to ask themselves, how do we create an engaged community? How do we get people talking to each other? How do we get people involved in uh, the direction and the focus and the evolution of the mm -hmm. ecosystem? Mm -hmm. And I think Dash is a great case study as a cryptocurrency for an effective, productive community. You can say what you will about the economics of it or issues they've had with the instamine or whatever the heck that was and uh, whether the treasury is good or bad everybody has opinions in that matter what you cannot deny is that they're utterly committed to growing their community and, and uh, really pushing the community forward and fixing things mm -hmm. so I, I think that's the core innovation that they brought into the uh, into the discussion that's why i actually had roman look into the the treasury model with his team and they did a lot of really good work um and he's absolutely right that the work that Dash has done uh, is not theoretically based. So, you know, like we're cryptographers at IOHK and mathematicians and computer scientists. And so how we start is we start from first principles. We write a white paper. We define a security model. We clearly define our adversary. We have a notion of what the threat tree looks like. We do a literature review to see what's been done before. We write a white paper. We implement a prototype. We see if the prototype is practical. And we go through peer review and iterate. Now, this process has the advantage of capturing uh, most of the stuff that's been done before and really clearly defining where it works and where it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Now, the disadvantage of this model is that it's slow and it's methodical. So if your goal is to innovate quickly and you don't care too much if there's a potential mistake or a flaw, then you can start from the other side, which is start from the heuristics and the implementation. So you try to accrue a bunch of best practices and say, oh, well, um, you know, in general, this is what people ought to do. And you have some working hypotheses, you implement it, you release it, and then you say the market and the community will tell me where it's wrong. This is basically how Bitcoin was constructed in a nutshell. And Dash followed that model with the treasury. So philosophically speaking, we kind of do things a little differently, um, but there, there's a lot of um, magic to studying systems that have been released like this because they kind of inform your design space and they kind of give you a sense of what's working and uh, what's not working. Um, yeah. Can I can I ask a question? So sure. you said something that that caught my attention. You said that Dash, that their treasury model, uh, they had a new version. I think you called it version 12. So 12.1 was a hard fork oh. that they did. And they did do some improvements to the core oh. protocol. So when we did our analysis, it was actually unfortunately timed. Um, we did the analysis right when there was both a community split occurring with Dash as well as a, a hard fork that they had planned. And uh, we, we were right in the middle of all of it, so it made it a little difficult to interact with the core developers. And also, some of the flaws that we discovered were later addressed. Um, and so, it would be nice to do a new report, because I think the report we have is a little out of date. Um, but, uh, but overall, uh, they've done a very good job moving forward, and it seems like the core developers really have a, a legitimate desire to improve their protocol in every aspect. Mm -hmm. um, important to understand that Dash inherited most of its features from Bitcoin. It's a fork of Bitcoin, and what they did is they tore a lot of stuff out and replaced it with some new algorithms. Like uh, they replaced the consensus algorithm with, I think it's X11, and you know they've done a bunch of other things. But in conceptually speaking, it, it's very, it's it's got a lot of Bitcoin DNA in it. As Dash evolves and changes, it's going to start removing some of that DNA and becoming yeah. something different. Yeah. The reason that that's that drew my attention is because they don't necessarily have they don't have one shot to get it right they they could try something and then uh make a new version and then if 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 you find some other improvements they could do they could make it come out with another version version 13 or whatever and so mm -hmm. I, I like that idea that it's it's not that you you're stuck with some decision you made a long time ago and there's no way to change it so right well, yeah, there's a caveat to that. Um, and this is where yeah, I mentioned I was going to get back to titanic driven development with Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, there's Moses driven development. We tend to follow that when you're a startup or you're a small cryptocurrency. But when you get really big and prominent, like Ethereum or like Bitcoin, now you've got a lot of cheddar that's at risk. You know, with Bitcoin, it's 20 billion. With Ethereum, and I think it's 2.5 billion as of this recording. That's a lot of money. And, and all of a sudden, you, you start getting really, really, really paranoid that even small changes could damage your house of cards. And 
everything comes collapsing down. So the speed and the quality at which you start making decisions naturally deteriorates because it's less about how do we innovate and how do we compete, and it's more about how do we preserve what we have. Yeah. That's the first point. And every great organization, whether it be Microsoft or Google or Apple, they, they start going down those roads and you start seeing a market decline in their ability to innovate because of it. So um, Dash, as it grows, um, I have no doubt it's going to fall into that same pattern where, yeah, right now it's pretty easy. I think when they made the 12.1 hard fork, they were under $100 million of market cap and they're very centralized in their development. So, you know, it's pretty easy to do that. But when you get to a billion dollars and you have competing groups and so forth, um, it's a lot more challenging. So it actually brings me back to my point about what we're aiming to try to do for ETC is that we're not trying to copy Dash or copy Ethereum. Rather, what we're trying to ask is how, how do we, what type of core technology do we need to invest in and deploy into ETC to give us the ability to avoid both Titanic-driven uh, development and Moses-driven development where we actually have a, a kind of a way of managing the ecosystem without any central actors in charge, but still be agile and able to innovate and make good decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, some of this is technological, meaning that you just have to have good architecture and good ideas about how these components fit together and where these components are and how they need to be updated. Some of this is cultural, where there, there needs to be a, a, an understanding that no one should be in control of any one process. For example, with community management, it can't just be Carlo. It's got to have Carlos and a lot of other people. Uh, and so far, we've done a pretty good job as a community with that. Similarly, with development, whatever ETC dev does at some point will be counterbalanced by the growth and deep team and vice versa. And the community can, can see a fair debate occurring. So we're investing in some of the core technology uh, to accommodate that. And a treasury is a component, but it's not sufficient. It doesn't actually cover that entire space. You also need a way of debating changes to the protocol. And we were working on a project called ECIP Quorum. And if we have some time in this interview, we can certainly talk about it. But the basic idea is that it's a smart contract that allows people to propose ECIPs, discuss them, vote on them, and it'll provide a, a protocol level data point uh, for whether people have consented to a change to the protocol or not. Another thing that needs to be kind of flushed out is we need to get a better uh, ontology of our social contract, a better mapping of our social contract. And I've seen some great work done. Like there was a recent article where a person was trying to define the difference between immutability of history and immutability of process. Yeah, I saw that. Um, yeah, and, and, and the basic point of it is that we have to start defining our principles because anytime we make a change as a community, um, every change has to be vetted against that. Not I trust Charles or I trust Elaine or I trust Avatar or I trust Splix. And they're pretty honest guys, and I think they have our best interest in heart. Rather, you know, how, how do we go about uh, deciding whether this fits our values as a community to evolve? Uh, and that's the conversation we have to have. Now, the Treasury is really convenient in this because it actually creates a discussion already about funding. And funding is already connected to governance and to changes because a lot of the things that would be funded out of a Treasury model would actually come from uh, uh, desires to change the protocol. So. You know, if we look to the future, let's say six months a year and all this stuff is done and we've somehow gotten it into the protocol, what we could imagine a pipeline where people propose ballots on ECIP quorum, uh, they get voted on and the most prominent ones get turned into funding proposals and those funding proposals get funded out of the treasury. Another line of debate happens and once they're ratified and approved, it, you have near universal consensus to actually implement this and do a softer hard fork to get it into the protocol because you've already had a debate and you've had another debate about funding. So yeah. you've actually heard some, some uh, great pipeline there. And, and this is all decentralized. There is no server that hosts this. There's no GitHub repo that one particular group tends to control. There's no particular yeah. community curator in charge of it. It's just, uh, it's just all there. Right. Can I ask you a, a, another question about that that I was thinking of? Sure. So you're, you're a smart guy, so I hope you don't mind me asking this hard question. And I don't know what the answer is. But my understanding is that um, the reason we don't have electronic voting in American elections is because it's just the the vote. It's it's they haven't figured out a way to make it provably secure. I think Estonia maybe is one of the few that has electronic voting, but obviously there's people would be motivated if there was a to spend a lot of money trying to game the American presidential election. So. Um, in that sense, 
if let's say ETC, the, the market cap grew to, you know, several billion dollars, you would have the same situation where you have uh, well-funded actors trying to, right, hack the voting mechanism somehow. And so it, I'll take you know, a I'll take okay. a crack at it, and uh, I guess <laughs> Robert can take a crack at it too. We can we can we can see how much of the nut we can break. Um, okay. okay, so I, I have certainly seen a lot of the arguments for saying, oh, e-voting shouldn't happen, and you know a lot of it stems from saying, well, can you ever truly have a secure environment to do these types of things in? So let's say you have a perfect ideal protocol to do e-voting, but then that protocol has to run on software and it has to run on uh, hardware. So first, is your OS solid and capable? You know, do you have a perfectly secure version of Windows or Linux or Mac OS? And then second, are there any backdoors in your hardware that the OS runs on that somebody could exploit? And it, you know, and so so that's one of the big concerns about e-voting that I've seen from people. Like I watched a lecture out of Princeton uh, that that brought that issue up. Another issue is, well, what characteristics of voting do you want to have? Do you want to have a secret ballot, a not secret ballot? Um, and uh, what are you, what exactly are you voting on? And can you quantify value at risk? Now, something with a presidential election, it's really hard to do that. So, like, like, what what is the value of Donald Trump as president versus Hillary Clinton as president? You know, for any given actor, there's a utility function. You know, let's imagine it exists, and we can do some form of a calculation and say, for J.P. Morgan Chase, how much money will they make if Trump is president versus Hillary is president? I imagine that maybe the Rand Corporation or something could build a model like that, uh -huh. but with with ETC or Dash, you know, when you have a treasury model, uh, this is a very different animal because your value at risk is known ahead of time. You know, you're voting on a ballot and the ballot has a certain amount of funding and there's a total amount of money that lives in the treasury. Mm -hmm. So you already know how much money maximum can be gained from gaming the system. So your security model is more about how much money would an adversary have to spend to manipulate the system to gain access to this, uh, this amount of funding. So when you talk about a sovereign election, and an adversary might be willing to spend hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to manipulate that because there's you know, a massive, massive gain. If you're talking about a treasury with five or $10 million, very sophisticated, extremely mercurial attacks like backdooring hardware or things like that, they kind of go out the window. Furthermore, uh, there's also another topic here, which is can you discover fraud? So you know, all the time, the, the military and other entities, they build um, vaults and boxes in a way that if you tamper with them, if you break into them, uh, they, they might not be able to prevent the break-in, but they almost certainly tell you that they've been broken into. They've been built in a way to do that. So yeah. similarly, you can construct voting systems where maybe some fraud could potentially occur, but this fraud would be tamper discoverable, meaning that people would actually know that some cheating or monkey business has happened. It'd either be heuristically discovered or it's a property of the voting system itself. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing is that the blockchain space is very unique. And then if you compare it to regular US voters versus blockchain voters, US voters, you don't have a clear namespace, you don't have a clear identity space, you don't have a clear database to host and hold things in. And you don't also have strong cryptography built in to, to push these ballots through. Whereas when you're in the blockchain space, you have actually a secure immutable database that's programmable that you can put everything in. The code can't be tampered with. The ballots can't be tampered with. You have accurate, auditable, transparent accounting. So all of those things are, are known by default. And also you have civil resistance because if you say you have to have stake to vote, well, then you know, the only way you can become a voter is to become a stakeholder of the system. And those are known costs. Uh -huh. So. I agree that there needs to be a game theoretic analysis of the cost of attacks, but I, I think it's a simpler problem to solve um, a treasury voting model than it would be to solve for a, a national election or something like that. Okay, well, I like what you said about, uh, you said how the, the stakes aren't as high, and so the attackers wouldn't be so motivated if we were, if they were voting on something that was worth maybe a few hundred thousand. Um, so that's true if we are, if the, if they're voting on on something that's not so critical, but like let's the the switch from uh, there was the debate about whether ETC should stick with proof of work. Would something that critical and well, well, that's not know, something that's the scope of the treasury. So that's okay. another. Point. Yeah, so so there's, it's a good to distinguish between what gets funded and what gets implemented. So currently, there is no system. Uh, in the blockchain space to vote on forks. Now, Tezos is trying to do this, and I suspect that they'll have their, their launch and their sale and their beta. 
and we'll get a lot of great data out of that experiment. But as it stands right now, there is no way to describe uh, a protocol in a way that you can vote on changes to it and reliably have those changes happen. It's an extremely involved theoretical problem. A, because you have to define an ontology for a cryptocurrency, meaning you have to know what the classes are, um, the relations between those classes and the constraints, and be able to reason about all your propositions that would indicate problems. The second, you need a, a formal enough language that's machine understandable to fully describe the entire behavior and users of the protocol. And then you'd need to be able to come up with some sort of state transition function that allows you to convert the protocol into, uh, into a new configuration. That's yeah. what Tezos is trying to do. But the rigor and, and the amount of time you have to spend to do that kind of work is extraordinary. Now, we're, we're doing some research into how to do that, but I don't think we're going to get anywhere in a, a short period of time. Now, now on the, the other hand, talking about funding, it is entirely reasonable to say, okay, well, somebody could propose a proof of work, proof of stake algorithm. For example, we release twins coins and make a ballot to propose implementing that and, and putting it into an ECIP to propose to change the protocol. Now that people might be willing to fund that and that would get approved and uh, and then we would do the work and then it would sit there, but then there would still need to be another debate about whether to do the hard fork required to, to get that installed. Yeah. And that would not be necessarily uh, done automatically. That would be done through meat space, um, yeah. human processes. Anyway, going back to voting, um, Roman, do you have anything to add about uh, voting systems in general and whether they should be digital or not? Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> uh, maybe just a few words about uh, technical details of uh, Treasury. Uh, so uh, we looked uh, in. Uh, we we did uh, initial uh, analysis of uh, security. Uh, we looked uh, of uh, possible attack vectors. Of course, there are uh, a lot of uh, further work, uh, but uh, uh, we uh, we uh, implemented such make, uh, make, uh, such procedures in uh, Treasury that uh, crack in Treasury uh, as hard as cracking uh, Ethereum uh, Ethereum Classic blockchain uh, itself. So. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Uh, attacker uh, needs to involve a uh, huge uh, uh, funding uh, for for implementation of this attack. Uh, in practice, uh, uh, so if we have some limited system, uh, such system in practice uh, uh, potentially uh, have uh, uh, might might have some weak points, but uh, amount of funds needed to implement uh, to successfully uh, implement uh, an attack will be much much bigger than attacker's profit. So uh, uh, on successful implementation of it, uh, we use the following model: that uh, on success, uh, even uh, in the very unlikely case that uh, attack uh, might be successful, uh, in this uh, situation, uh, attacker uh, loses much more uh, comparing his gains. Uh, we use uh, st stake deposits uh, in our uh, proposal. Uh, we use uh, uh, limited funding and so on. So in this case, uh, uh, implementation of attack uh, becomes uh, uh, economically unreasonable. Uh, unreasonable. And we continue uh, with uh, further uh, theoretical research of uh, different uh, different models. Okay. Yeah. Do we have a threat analysis uh, in uh, in the uh, proposal? Did that end up ever end up getting its way into there? Uh, yes, uh, we did uh, initial analysis and we continue to work with our security analysis. We described uh, several types uh, of attack <coughs> and uh, we uh, provided uh, evidence that uh, uh, the system is uh, protected from uh, the, uh, such such uh, types of attack. Okay. Uh, for the general theoretical mo model of prob uh, probable security, it's a very, very complex question. We continue to work on them. Moreover, uh, such a treasury system is very, very complex. It requires... Uh, uh, analysis from very different point of views, uh, and uh, uh, we, we work on it, uh, uh, but the model is uh, very complex to give uh, full theoretical proof. Okay, and, and that uh, that's now, I like what you guys said um, that, and I know some people might be um, just quickly looking into this, but I think it's, it bears repeating that the message is not that now we're going to vote for everything. Everything is up in the air and up for grabs. Um, that it's just the the fund a a, a percentage of the funding uh, th that comes that right now is all going to mining. That's that's the only thing we're discussing. So that's I think good for yeah. people. To do. And let's talk about that. So, so you know when I, I when we first did the proposal, and I guess you know it kind of came out in a ham-fisted way. We. Uh, 
we said, hey, let's have a cool open source discussion about like monetary policy and treasury and so forth. And so we kind of broadcasted it and there was this huge wave of pushback and everybody's like, oh, they're going to put this in tomorrow and they're trying to destroy the chain and Dow 2.0. It's like, what the hell are you guys talking about? We're just, we're just, you know, just have, try to have a conversation here, guys. Uh, but, um, but anyway, uh, it's important to understand something. First, we are paying a tax right now. Everybody in Ethereum land, we pay a tax to the miners. So for the good of the chain, um, we pay out per block a Coinbase award to the miners via inflation. And 100% of that goes to one group of actors. Now, there's an, a more organic, natural question to ask, which is what are the collection of some total behaviors required for a properly functioning cryptocurrency? And uh, miners do not perform all of these behaviors. They just don't. You need to have development. You need to have people running full nodes. You need network relay. You need uh, marketing. You need legal defense in some cases. There's a whole bunch of things that could conceivably come up in a cryptocurrency's lifespan that are not compensated. And so the question is, if we're paying a tax, everybody in the ecosystem, do, does anybody run a government where 100% of all the tax revenue goes to one department, let's say to the Department of Education, and all the other departments get zero dollars, but are expected to perform their utility. It's it's madness. It's absolute nuts. The problem is that it's impossible right now for a human being to develop an algorithm, maybe forever, uh, that can perfectly account mechanistically for all of the funding that's required for each of these departments. So the treasury model is about saying, instead of saying 100% of the tax we currently have goes to just one department, Let's put it into a general fund and let's create a rule set that allows uh, the, the vast majority of the people in the ecosystem, the stakeholders, the people actually own the currency to decide on how the funds get allocated. So the miners still get their reward. Uh, they'll still get their coin base. They'll just get slightly less. So we're cutting one department's budget, but then we're putting it into a general fund to reallocate. Now, yeah, the problem is that you can create a great security model for this, but then you still have to figure out, well, how do you create incentives for people to participate? Are you paying enough for participation? Are you overpaying for participation? Um, who should be involved in deciding? That's kind of the liquid democracy notion of saying, like, should everybody be equal or there should be certain stakeholders that are domain experts that maybe should make certain decisions about certain things and can I delegate my vote and so forth? And also, is funding like a NAPS a zero one knapsack problem, where you know you you have a you know a certain amount that's available per month, and it either fits in the bag or it doesn't, or can you make it like a partial problem where you can have uh, counter ballots? Like for example, if Alice asks for ten thousand dollars, can we give her a counter proposal saying, would you be do we would you be willing to do the work for eight, and so yeah. forth? Okay, you just brought up an interesting point, which um, I. I hadn't thought of before, but the, the the reason it's easy to compensate miners is because their work is quantifiable, and so yeah. you can you can make an algorithm to pay them. But having been uh, a software developer for years and years, I know when you propose a contract and you negotiate the price, I know how difficult it is to quantify, you know, development work, for example. And so somebody could do one feat, add one feature, and maybe they had to work five, 10 times as hard as somebody else that did another feature. And so it's difficult to, to compensate development, for example. And so that's the reason we need a treasury model. If it was easy to quantify all these other actors, then they would already be getting compensated, presumably. Right. That, that's the basic idea is saying that there's a difference between dry code and wet code. The dry stuff can be quantified by computers. The wet stuff requires fleshy human brains and judgment to figure out. And also it requires social credibility. You know, it, it, what we're doing with Growth and Deke is proving to the community we know how to build an Ethereum client and we're competent. You know, we do that brick by brick, piece by piece, meeting by meeting, code commit by code commit. And I would never say, okay, invest in this team and trust this team to go take the roadmap and go somewhere until they've gone through that road because they, they have to show that they're passionate, that they understand, that there's no wizard behind the curtain and so forth. So I think an, an unspoken component, and it's not something I believe we can rigorously quantify with a treasury model, is the social component of the ecosystem, the, the how do we assess who's credible and who's not credible. And really, that's just a matter of merit and time and commitment. 
you know, yeah, everybody who's like ETC Deb, for example, has put in a tremendous amount of time, much of which has probably not been compensated. So they have a very high degree of credibility and reputation in the system. So if they, for example, were to ask for funding, almost certainly they would get it over an outside team, even a credible company, like if a, you know, a Cognitech or an FB Complete came in and said, we'd build a competing client. People say, well, we know you're competent, but who are you guys? You know, what have you yeah. done for the system and the community? And, and that's another component about it is it's kind of like an implicit reward for being a good actor in, in the system, having something like this. Um, uh, anything you want to add to that, Roman? Uh, so, uh, yes, I, uh, agree, uh, I agree with you. Uh, so uh, here uh, we have a complex system. This complex system requires very comprehensive analysis. Uh, and uh, we are uh, on the initial, initial point of it, and uh, we continue to work with it. Yes. Okay, great. So um, is there anything else uh, any of you guys want to add? Uh, any message you want to get out about your treasury work that we haven't covered? So a couple of things, logistical things. First off, the proposal that we made, and, and let's try to quantify things in relation to ECIP 1017, because it was just extremely unfair misinformation about that spread by certain people who just were not willing to have a reasonable conversation. Um, the point of ECIP 1017 was about quantifying the maximum amount of ether that will exist. That was the point. So we're setting a ceiling and we're setting an emission rate to build up to that ceiling. I don't think anybody's going to fully debate that. Okay. And the point of the treasury model was saying currently 100% of those funds are earmarked to one department in our government. Let's go ahead and see if we can take a percentage of that and move it to a general fund and then have that general fund be available for the community to spend. That does not increase inflation. That does not increase the total supply in any capacity. Uh, all that does is reallocate funds from one constituency to a different constituency. And frankly, it's in that constituency's best interest to have stable, reliable funding for the growth of the ecosystem, because would you rather mine um, a dead coin or would you rather mine Dash, which yeah. is worth $500 million, and you've just gotten a 10x in, in, the, in the recent trading patterns over these things. So sometimes investing some of your proceeds into the growth of the community is, is a, a good idea. The second point, uh, and this there's been a much conflation about this, is that this is some sort of desire to create a DAO 2.0. And we should probably have a reasonable discussion about what happens when things go wrong. So there are three ways you can implement a treasury model. One way is to implement it via a smart contract. And now, unless you do a hard fork to guarantee funding, it's really a pointless model because it's not a treasury, it's a donation pool. And what, we go back to the same problems we have in donation land. Okay. And the second way is to modify the core protocol to accommodate a treasury model, uh, model itself. Now, this is uh, the most efficient and optimal way of doing things, but it also carries the highest degree of risk because if you make a mistake, it does require you to tinker with the core protocol again. And these are always dangerous changes. Now, there is a hybrid solution where what you can do is you can construct a smart contract, hard fork to fund that smart contract, and then that smart contract is like a spigot where it can be turned on and off by a stakeholder vote of people in the system. So it doesn't have any ballot mechanics or treasury mechanics in it, but it has an aggregation function. And then it's hooked up to a side chain, and that side chain actually contains the treasury itself, and funds are sent to that side chain on a regular interval. And then the side chain is where all the ballots are stored, where all the communication occurs, uh, where you know consensus is reached and so forth, and it gets paid out. Now, if there's a problem with the side chain, what you would do is you just simply cut the spigot off so funds would continue to aggregate. You'd fork the side chain, fix all the problems, and then you turn the spigot back on once the side chain has been fixed. Now, that doesn't interfere with the operation of the core protocol. And also, it uh, it only value at risk would be whatever's in nexus into the side chain for that particular month. So you you actually have a situation where um, you're limiting your your failure. So whether we we would propose a smart contract, a protocol enhancement, or a side chain, I think the only way to answer that question is actually implement all three and show how they would work and have a detailed technical discussion, a cost benefit analysis, a risk analysis, and so forth. We never once made a proposal saying this is going to be implemented on Tuesday and everybody go and, and put it in. Yet certain people somehow represented it this way. And it, uh, it, it was extremely demoralizing and just frankly incredibly unfair.
Um, yeah. I'm not in the business of building Dow. You know, I, I, it's it's just unbelievable to me that uh, people would say that. But you know, it is what it is. It's it's a space. You have to be. You have to accept it. Um, another another point is that uh, our hope is to have a constructive discussion about. Uh, the Treasury model and uh, a discussion about things like ECIP quorum and also how we create a balance of power in Ethereum Classic land. I think what we have to understand with Ethereum Classic is that uh, we earn the right to be born, but we have to earn the right to live. So when the DAO hack occurred and there was a betrayal of the social contract as a result of the hard fork, it gave us the right to create a competing currency. And uh, we have endured as a community an enormous amount of hardship. Uh, you were there during the early days, Christian. Yeah. I mean, you saw what was going on in Slack. And, um, you know, the Ethereum Foundation dumped 90% of their Ether uh, Classic stake. You know, a lot of people tried to drive the price down. There were threats of 51% attacks. Um, there, Everybody every week was trying to do something to kill the network. We had to do hard forks. The replay attack had to be resolved. I mean, it was it was a very stressful, brutal road. And we lived through all of that. And now, now what's emerged is a very, very resilient cryptocurrency. But yeah. you cannot... So, so what, I, what I hear you saying is, um, so like, for example, the Dash, their, their initial feature was anonymity. And it, it would be nice if that one innovation was enough to take over the world, but they had to then add the, the treasury model and keep innovating. And um, so with ETC, you're saying we... we uh, believe immutability is is a uh, is important. It's 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 core. It's crucial. It's um, but that years unfortunately that one that one principle is not enough to then win over the world and take over. It. Everything's going to be great from now right, on. Right, right, right. Because because frankly, there's too much competition in the space for us to even hope to survive in that respect. So. For example, if you look at Bitcoin with rootstock and you look at the emergence of Ethereum, um, you know, if you love immutability and proof of work, at some point, smart contracts are coming to Bitcoin. If not this year, then next year, but it'll come. And it's super, super hard to argue that Bitcoin has betrayed the principles of immutability. They, they've stood fast amongst Mt. Gox and a million other things, and they're not going anywhere. In fact, they're, they're so big that, that they can't even change small things. So uh, I would argue that if all you're here for is mutability and proof of work with smart contracts, uh, that is not sufficient for the cryptocurrency to evolve, thrive, and grow into a healthy ecosystem that would be on par with what Ethereum has accomplished. Mm -hmm. So you have to, just like Dash did, say, okay, we got to move from dark coin to something else. Let's let's innovate. And so the, the, the challenge behind innovation is to find a way to do innovation commensurate with the principles that the community was founded on. And the community, I think, the core principle goes beyond immutability. It's this desire for lack of centralized control. Mm -hmm. it, it, no one likes saying that somebody is in charge of Ethereum Classic, myself included. I think it's extremely bad from the very beginning. I said I don't want to be the guy who runs the show, and I don't want anybody else to be the guy that runs the show. The goal here is to have no one in charge. So our challenge is, how do we find a way to innovate? How do we find a way to differentiate ourselves from Ethereum and from what's coming down the pipe with Bitcoin and other competitors, but do it in a way where we're as decentralized as possible and we're as resilient as possible to people trying to co-opt the platform? Then we actually have a very solid value proposition to DAP developers and to other people where we're saying, listen, no one's going to come along and rip the rug out from underneath you. You know, and if you're if you're a guy who builds infrastructure in your healthcare company or an IoT company or something, you want to put billions of dollars worth of infrastructure on something, you're the CTO of that company. You can't go to your CEO and say, "Oh, yeah, I want to build on this platform." And by the way, they can have a hard fork at any moment, and there's these these three guys decide that, and they're kind of weird dudes. Mm -hmm. They would be like, "You're the craziest person alive." Instead, you want to say like, "If it's going to change, there's a process to change it, like the web." It's slow, it's methodical, it's meticulous, funding materializes, consensus materializes, no, no surprises. And actually, if we have good ideas, we can be part of that process and steer it in the right direction um, for a mutual benefit of both parties. They say, oh, yeah, that platform sounds a lot better to me. That sounds like stable infrastructure to, uh, to deploy upon. So I, I think that needs to be the direction that we as a community at ETC have to aspire towards. We have to, we have to work in that, in that flow. And it requires a huge commitment. It means that every time we see centralization of power, we have to kind of break it up, whether it be mining centralization or developer centralization, 
or we've noticed that all the conversations happen to be happening in one channel. For example, with ECIP um, 1017, we had reached good community consensus about it uh, within the Slack and within Reddit and other channels, but there was no consensus in China. So one of the uh, things we did is we sent Carlo out to China. We said, let's have Roy and Carlo and other people go in and talk about ECIP 1017 because uh, you know the, the quote unquote power brokers had decided, oh, this is great, but that doesn't actually reflect the will and whim of the community, especially the people who were uh, hosting the network up by a hash power. Yeah. So that's, that's what we need to be constantly vigilant of is uh, yeah. developing a, an immune system that stamps out centralization, recognizes when conversations have become siloed and echo chambery. And our hope is to invest in tools like the treasury system and uh, things like ECIP quorum where basically we, we can hold more more decentralized conversations. Yeah, um, and um, I I think what one of the things you said, I, it, it personally to me it seems like the strongest argument for needing to keep innovating that um, other people can other other crypto coins can come out with smart contracts that also support immutability, and so all of a sudden that's not going to be so distinguishing anymore and this i was i'm i'm kind of a little armchair uh game theoretician myself and i i had the thought a couple weeks ago i brought it up on slack that the what if the um the uh ethereum decided one day to say you know what okay fine we made a mistake with the the dow hard fork and from now on we're going to admit our mistake and we're going to believe in immutability and and that's going to be a core principle, and we learned our lesson that that could cut the legs out from ETC, um, and so then all of a sudden that's not a distinguishing feature of ETC anymore. Now that probably won't happen, but I think your point is is well said that other other currencies, other communities could could have that principle as well. Right. Um, well, I would be skeptical even if they did that. I mean, the, the underlying cause of that behavior is because of the centralized way in which Ethereum is developed. It's it's following a Moses-driven development pattern. You know, there's a small group of actors who have tremendous influence over the roadmap, the direction, and uh, the philosophy of Ethereum. And as long as you have that, even if those groups said, oh, well, immutability is now a core principle again, uh, they would, they, they might revert back to old behavior the minute it becomes inconvenient. And what are you going to do to stop them? You can't. Yeah. You know, that's that's the that's the whole point. So I think skepticism from a game theoretic aspect would probably keep people in our in our camp. But um, but anyway, I mean, nothing is permanent. And uh, this is just a proposal. Uh, it's up on our website. And if you could put uh, the link to it in the show notes, that'd be great. OK, uh, I want everybody to read it. Send us emails. Um, Roman, how big is your team right now working on the Treasury proposal? Can you can you kind of tell us a little bit about who's working on it and who's on the team? Uh, so uh, besides me uh, in uh, in team, uh, we have uh, uh, three uh, uh, PhD uh, specialists. Uh, uh, they uh, all uh, have uh, background uh, in cryptography. One of them is uh, a professor uh, from uh, Kiev with very deep uh, mathematical uh, background, uh, and uh, uh, she uh, works with uh, deep theoretical crypto analysis with uh, deep uh, analysis of uh, voting system. And uh, besides that, we have uh, PhD students who also work, uh, who uh, are extremely good in gaining new information, collecting inf all information in uh, analysis of huge uh, amounts of data, and so on. Uh, we have uh, a, a rather big team, and this big team uh, has unique specialists from uh, different areas, from deep, deep theoretical crypto, uh, going through uh, uh, practical implementation, deep source co uh, code analysis uh, with uh, simulation uh, properties uh, and uh, co uh, uh, collecting and uh, analysis information, which is uh, publicly available. Right. Great. Um, Christian, if you could just edit that last uh, dialogue a little bit. Okay. Uh, what yeah. is there something you want me to add or remove from that? Or? Just, just, just the clarification where where I asked about the team and that whole thing. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then, and then uh, just just to add to the uh, to the team, uh, we're going to be adding to it. So um, we're in discussions with some people from Lancaster. We also might bring somebody from Oxford who's got a very strong game theory background to start looking at the protocol. And uh, we may bring in some InfoSec people from RPI Sec as well. 
And that's the starting point. But actually, we're looking for more people. So if anybody wants to work on the Treasury proposal with us, analyzing it, adding to it, uh, modifying it, debating whether it's necessary or not, uh, we highly, highly, highly encourage that you reach out to Roman. Uh, and then we can start a conversation. We're, uh, we're actually looking to hire. Um, we're also looking for a healthy debate. Uh, so what I mean by healthy debate is that you actually come and say, okay, well, if you want to accomplish this goal, here are the problems you're going to have, and here are your issues, and here's why I think the goal is not viable or is viable. That's a debate. Uh, if you're saying treasure model is worthless, you guys suck, uh, you're trying to take over the ecosystem, just don't send me an email. I, 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 don't, have, I don't have time for that. Uh, so anybody who wants to contribute and wants to have a discussion about the usefulness, the necessity, or other other characteristics of such a system for this or ECIP quorum, uh, please do reach out to, to Roman, uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, try to make a, some form of accommodation. My goal is to build a team, probably around uh, I'd say about ten people to fifteen people total on the Treasury team, and the output of this process is going to be a reference Treasury model. So it'll have some parameterizations. And we can, we're going to certainly parameterize it as an ECIP for Ethereum Classic, but it can be used in other cryptocurrencies as well. So that's kind of uh, the benefit to IOHKs. You know, we're in the business of building cryptocurrencies. And in our opinion, one of the big pillars of sustainability is long term is going to be a treasury model. Uh, it, it helps you in a lot of different ways, as we've discussed. So we're going to put this up on the shelf and, and pull it off uh, whenever we build one of them. So, uh, you know, we would love the community's help to 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 get us to that point where it's it's analyzed and it's measured and implemented and balanced to a point where we have a high degree of assurance that it's a good idea. Um, you know, we'll probably, as I said, do a smart contract implementation of it to just see how it works. Um, we'll also do a, a proposal for how it would look if we modified the protocol. And what's really interesting to me is the possibility of doing it as a side chain, as an independent system. And here's actually the interesting reason why. Because if it's a side chain, you potentially could do use a treasury, the same treasury for more than one cryptocurrency. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of like a, a trippy mind thing, right? So let's yeah. say Dash decides to outsource their treasury model. And they could build a side chain to this treasury layer. And the same group of people could make votes, decisions on Dash uh, funding as they could for ETC funding. And you could actually have this emergence of kind of like a decentralized meta government uh, in the in the space. So that's a, that's kind of out there, and uh, it'd be interesting to think about it. But it is pretty a cool idea that you could have governance as a service in addition to consensus as a service, as we've typically seen in yeah. the emergence of these types of people. So uh, that's overall the scope in the project. Uh, you know, thanks for having us on. I do appreciate it. Do you have any more questions for uh, Roman or me? Uh, no, I just have one thought to just encourage both of you. The um, uh, I, I'm I'm very good at saying stupid things, so if this is stupid, just uh, tell me so. But uh, so my my understanding was that one of the reasons America is so successful was because the founding fathers wanted to basically have, uh, in a sense, decentralized system. Right? You have competing branches of government, and so I see blockchain at blockchains as kind of it, the the core principle of the the core feature is that nobody's in control. Again, it's it's decentralized, and so that to me that really seems to improve the world when you've got these systems that people can rely on, they trust. There's there's freedom, and so if you are improving this uh, gov governance treasury model for ETC, uh, maybe this will lead to improved democracy overall. I mean that's a that's a grand thought for you guys. You guys might be doing something with more impact than you might think. I, I appreciate your passion for decentralization and not wanting to you know, you think control. You think um, Ukrainian politics at all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but I, I have high hopes for what you guys are doing. Right. Um, it's it's uh, it's a fun pursuit. You know, it's kind of funny because a lot of people in the space say that oh, blockchains are going to replace governments and replace money and all these other things. And we look to where we we we've handled governance. And with Bitcoin, we can't even decide on a parameter change. You know, we can't yeah, decide yeah. on implementing something as simple and innocent as seg segregated witness. So w when you 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 have the inability to make small changes to a system, I don't think these systems are ready to be used in uh, a context of a government. So actually, that's that's a super exciting prospect of where we could take Ethereum Classic is to demonstrate that you can actually lead 
a cryptocurrency in a decentralized way, you can actually have a balance of power. You don't have to elect a Moses. And uh, if that works, I think you you are right in that it's a kind of a micro experiment um, for a broader scale system. And then you could say maybe in the future, this can be used for a system of political governance and uh, actually making decisions about how a government ought to work and so forth. Yeah. But I think we have a long way to go. And you know we haven't even gotten a successful treasury proposal implemented in Ethereum <laughs> platform. So, yeah. so if that doesn't happen, then maybe maybe the whole government thing goes out the window. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, thanks again, guys. It's been a great discussion and uh, appreciate you guys coming on. Welcome. Thank you. Time. So much.